This is the all-new Aston Martin DBX. And it isn't just any DBX, this one actually happens to be my wife's DBX. Now, we were one of the first people to get invited to see this behind closed doors at Monterey Car Week back in 2019. And I'll be totally honest with you, at the time, I had absolutely zero, and I mean zero, interest in an SUV from Aston Martin. We weren't even in the market for a new car whatsoever, especially one of these. When they brought us into the theater where they were going to show this, my expectations were really, really low. Truth be told, I had been a little bit disappointed with the new cars in Aston Martin's lineup, so I had pretty low expectations for this one. But I'll tell you, that all changed in about one millisecond, because when they unveiled this, it was clear to me and everybody else in that theater, there were probably a dozen people or so, that this was way better than what anybody had expected. They brought us up to see the car up close and to sit in it, and I'll tell you, it took maybe 90 seconds for me to go from having zero interest at all to me telling my wife, you need one of these. Within about 30 minutes of that, we had our names on the list to get one of the first ones, and well, 16 months later, the car finally arrived. The thing that stood out to me the most when I first saw the DBX was the front end. The front end of this is my favorite front end of any of Aston Martin's current lineup. And a lot of that has to do with the proper Aston Martin grill. It's not some cheap chicken wire looking grill. It's not a plastic oversized egg crate grill. It is a proper DB5 inspired metal slatted grill, the way it ought to be on an Aston Martin. It looks fantastic. And it's not just the grill that I like. The headlights look good. The hood vents look good. The giant Aston Martin badge on the front looks good. The whole shape of it just looks like the front of an Aston Martin. But now if I've got a nitpick, I'm going to nitpick on these, the running lights down here. It's not that I have a problem with this design. The design is fine. What I have a problem with is that these lights look like Aston Martin stole them off of a Kia Telluride. The DBX does not look like they took an SUV and just slapped on a bunch of Aston Martin bits. Instead, it looks like they took an actual Aston Martin and stretched it out into the shape of an SUV. And what I mean by that is, well, I mean, just look at it. The front end looks like the front end of an Aston Martin. It's got a beautiful classic side straight. The entire window line, this whole thing is very Aston Martin looking. Additionally, beyond just big things like that, the paint. In this car, we have white stone. Aston Martin does some of the best paint jobs in the entire automotive industry, and it's no exception on the DBX. The white stone paint job on here is kind of like a glittery mirror. When you see this in person, you know this is not a normal SUV. It stands out because of the quality of not just the paint job, but all of the parts on here. It's just a step up, and you can tell that in person. These are the ribbon wheels. They're one of the upgrades for the car. In my opinion, these are the coolest looking OEM wheels of any car in automotive history. Now, arguably the most controversial part of the DBX is going to be the rear end here. Personally, I like it, but that's because I've seen this in person, and it does look a lot better in person than I think it looks in photos. First of all, we've got this enormous long taillight here. It's a taillight that was basically taken off of the Aston Martin Vantage, and I'm sure that Vantage owners aren't too thrilled that uh, their taillight was used on an SUV, but nevertheless, it looks really good. The part that I think most people have issue with, though, is right down here, right? We've got a huge amount of blank space. And up here, we've got the Aston Martin lettering. Now, this lettering is something that they've been doing on all of their new models. And it's also something that a lot of owners choose to not have put on because let's be honest, I mean, it's just kind of a little cheesy, I think. But on the DBX, it's kind of a little bit necessary because this is the only thing that kind of fills in this space. There is a lot of space here. I get where people are coming from, but in person, it really does look a whole lot better. Now, the lower part of the rear here, I think, looks pretty good as well, but I do have one issue with it, and that's regarding the exhaust. So we got the upgraded sport exhaust on our DBX, but unfortunately, there's no really easy way to tell that we have it because these exhaust tips look pretty much the same as the exhaust tips on a regular exhaust in a DBX. Personally, I think that they should have done a dual exhaust on this. There's obviously space for it over here, I don't know why they didn't. 
Uh, I think it would have actually made the back of the car look a little bit more aggressive. I think it would have looked really good and it would have made me feel better about paying all that money for the sport exhaust. Now, while I'm on the topic of the exhaust, I'm going to say that the one thing that my wife and I found a little bit disappointing about the DBX is the exhaust note. It's not that the exhaust note sounds bad. Don't get me wrong. It sounds really good. The problem is that you have to put a lot of effort into it in order to make that exhaust come out. Now, let me just give you an example here. On my 2014 Vanquish, when I start that car up in the garage, it's glorious. I mean, that sound is incredible, right? I mean, it just wakes the whole neighborhood up and it wakes you up. The DBX, however, is a bit of a different story. You see what I mean? I mean, it's, it's not bad, it's just not that exciting. It's just an okay startup sound. Additionally, when I drive my Vanquish, I can drive it literally through a school zone and be at 1500 RPM doing nothing and it'll still pop and gurgle for me. The DBX, however, in order to pop and gurgle this exhaust, you gotta be running it 4,500 to 5,000 RPM. You've gotta be running it pretty hard at that RPM. Additionally, just driving it in general, I find that in order to really get sound out of it, I've got to be in a much lower gear than feels comfortable most of the time. It's not that it sounds bad. It sounds good. It's just a lot more effort has to be put into making this car make sound than what I normally have to do on other Astons. The interior of the DBX is a really nice place to be. And it's a significant upgrade from the other interiors in their other cars. Now, you may remember at the beginning of this video, I mentioned that I had been a little bit disappointed with the other cars in Aston Martin's new lineup. And a lot of that had to do with the interiors. This interior is finally back on track. This interior looks unique. It's beautiful. It's got a memorable design. And best of all, the infotainment screen has been integrated back into the design. The other cars in their lineup have what I like to call the floating iPad, right? It's just a screen on a stick sticking up. And this is a very popular trend right now in the automotive world because almost every car out there is doing that. Tesla started it about a decade ago and everyone has been copying it ever since. And personally, I think it is the worst, ugliest, horriblest design fad in the auto business right now. I want it to go away. And I'm glad that Aston Martin made it go away because this integrated screen looks so much better than an iPad on a stick. The DBX is, well, it is a vegan's nightmare because there is leather everywhere in this thing. I mean, even the speaker covers are leather. And the great thing is you can customize the leather however you want because they've got a million different colors to choose from. In this one, we went with a two-tone look, but you can also do monotone. You can do contrast stitching like we did, or you can do matching stitching. There's just a ton of options. So the seats in the DBX are basically the same seats out of a DB11. And they're very nice seats. We've got ours pretty much maxed out with all the stitching and the broguing options. And we've also got the seats with all the fancy controls on them. And they're reasonably comfortable. But in all honesty, they're not as comfortable as the seats in a Bentley Bentayga. The Bentley Bentayga seats are the kind of seats that you just sink into and you don't want to leave. Also, the Bentayga has seat massagers. Pretty much every luxury SUV out there has an option for seat massagers, but not the DBX. There's no option for that. And that was a really big disappointment for me and my wife because for years we'd been saying her next car might be a Bentley because, well, we wanted those seat massagers. And when we found out that the DBX didn't have it, we almost didn't order the car just because of that one thing. The center console here is also really nice. So we have ours with a wood veneer. This can be ordered with all sorts of different materials, everything from carbon fiber, piano black. You can do solid walnut, I think, as a uh, wood option as well. All sorts of options for this. And what's cool, too, is that underneath it is this really interesting feature where they have a hollow pass-through that goes underneath the console. And the idea of this, so we were told, was so that the ladies would have somewhere to put their purses. 
And my wife was all excited about this because she's always struggling with what to do with her purse when she gets into a car. But when we took delivery of this one, we immediately realized that this little pass-through isn't actually big enough to fit a normal sized purse. It's more sized for a small clutch, according to my wife, whatever clutch is. But, um, you know, it's still, it's good storage for other things, water bottles and just stuff. You can also customize the ambient lighting for nighttime. So there's some neat lights that go through here at night. It's nothing, you know, over the top or anything like that, but you can in the infotainment screen choose from pretty much every color of the rainbow. And also what's cool is that you can customize it so that like my wife is one color at night and when I'm driving, it's a different color at night. The visibility in here when you're driving is actually pretty good. I mean, when you look through the rear view mirror, it is a bit tunnel visioned. I'll be honest about that. But luckily the side view mirrors are really big and the whole window line is nice and open. So there's really no problem with seeing any of the cars around you. I've never had any problem with blind spots in here. There is a tremendous amount of space in the back of the DBX. I mean, your passengers are never going to complain about legroom or anything like that back here because there's a ton of it. Additionally, this enormous glass roof up here, it just lets in a ton of light and it opens up the space. So it really just feels like it's much more open than it is. You don't feel like you're in the back of a sardine can. As far as storage space goes, well, these seats obviously fold flat like they would in any SUV and you have a pretty decent amount of storage back here when you do that. Underneath the floorboards in the back, there is a spare tire. Now this car has 22 inch wheels, so they're obviously not going to put a full size 22 inch spare back there. Instead, what they have is this rather ingenious collapsible spare. It's basically an accordioned tire. When you inflate it, it accordions out into a full size tire. And when you deflate it, it accordions back in. There's also several buttons back here. You've got some buttons on the right that are used to release the seats back here to fold flat. And on the other side, there are some buttons that you can use to raise and lower the air suspension. Unfortunately, the biggest negative thing I can say about the DBX is the tech in this car. And it's a combination of just dated tech and frankly, missing tech. I mean, we talked about the lack of seat massagers earlier. That's one item, but there's also no heads up display, no soft closed doors, no four wheel steering. There's Apple CarPlay, but not wireless Apple CarPlay. And there's no Android auto for that matter. Well, if we go back to the cubby down here, you'll notice that there's a iPhone shaped indentation. Well, this used to be, at least it was supposed to be a wireless charging pad. At least that's what we were told back when we ordered the car. But apparently Aston Martin for reasons unknown decided to remove the wireless charging pad. Nevertheless, they still have the indentation for the phone down there. Now you might be thinking, okay, that's fine. Whatever. I'll just plug my phone in, but guess what? There are no, USB ports anywhere here. There's not even a 12 volt cigarette plug that you could put a USB adapter into nothing. The USB ports and the 12 volt port, they're in the armrest. And what that means is that you either got to shove your phone in there or you have to do what we've done, which is run a USB cable out of the armrest. And unfortunately there's not even a groove, a slot for this cable to come out of. So the cable is just kind of being pinched by the armrest and it's just kind of dangling here. I can still put my phone down where the charging pad is. And that usually is where I put it when I'm charging it, because for some reason there's this little tray right here that I don't know what that's for because it's not big enough to hold a phone. I think it's just to hold your key for some reason, but it does not hold a phone. So you have to put your phone down there, run a cable all the way to it. And frankly, that's just an inexcusably bad design. I don't know why. I mean, okay, if you take out the wireless charging pad, that's fine. But geez, please at least give us some USB ports. Additionally, a lot of the driving tech in the car, it just doesn't feel up to date. I mean, there's really no advanced technology in here. It has adaptive cruise control, but big deal. I've got adaptive cruise control in my eight year old Jeep. It has what they are calling lane keep assist, but it's a horrible implementation of that. I mean, a few weeks before we took delivery of this, I was driving around in a, a Land Rover Defender and it had a fantastic lane keep option. You'd go down the road and if you started veering into the other lane, the steering wheel would automatically steer you back. 
And it was actually a lot of fun to play around with that. And it was useful and it was a very effective safety feature. In the DBX, however, the lane keep assist is almost completely useless because all it does, and it doesn't do it all the time, it vibrates the steering wheel. So if you're going over the line, sometimes it buzzes and you feel it in the steering wheel. Oh, I'm going over the line. Now, according to the instruction manual, when you do this or when this happens, the car is supposed to automatically use the anti-lock brake system on one side of the car to pull you back over. First of all, in the two months we've had this car, I've only felt that ABS kick in once when I crossed the line and it did not pull me back over. All it did was slow the car down. So the lane keep assist simply doesn't work. My wife and I both just turn it off because the buzzing of the steering wheel is annoying and it doesn't save us anything in any way. And what's extra peculiar about this is that this car does have parking assist. There is hardware in here for the car to control the steering wheel, but it only works for parking assist. It does not work for lane assist. And that is mind boggling to me. If you're going to have the hardware in here, why not do a proper implementation of lane assist? Now, the piece of technology that most people are going to be using every time they get into this car is the infotainment system. And unfortunately, this infotainment system is based on the old Mercedes command system. Mercedes has discontinued that. They are now using what they call the MBUX system. But unfortunately, Aston Martin's deal with Mercedes is that they get the hand-me-downs. And this hand-me-down is terrible. First of all, it's not a touchscreen. It looks like a touchscreen, but it's not. Everybody who gets into this car tries pressing the buttons that are on the screen and it does nothing because instead you have to control everything with this wheel and little clicky buttons down here. Without going into it, and I could spend a half an hour talking about this infotainment system, it's a cluttered mess. And trying to use this wheel to navigate through that menu system when you're driving, it's just not practical. I mean, it really is just a big mess. Don't get me wrong. I'm thrilled that the screen is integrated. It's a high resolution screen. I like the size of it. The system is reasonably responsive, but it's just not a good system. I mean, the old Uconnect system in my eight-year-old Jeep. I'm not exaggerating. It's better than this. I've basically given up trying to do anything while driving. Luckily, the car does have a microphone button here. You can do voice commands. So if I need to get to the navigation screen, I can do the voice command, say navigation, it'll take me there. Or if I want satellite radio, I can press that button, say satellite radio, it'll take me there. This is still much slower than just pressing a single button on the screen like I can in my Jeep but at least it's better than trying to use this horrible wheel control. Additionally, talking about the controls on the steering wheel, oh boy, here's where the biggest, biggest beef I have is. There is no dedicated button on this steering wheel for changing radio stations. So say you're on satellite radio and you wanna change to your next favorite, but your next favorite, well, say you're on channel 10 and you need to go to channel 50. There's no way to do it. What you have to do is you go into the navigation, uh, or I'm sorry, the home menu here, you go down to radio, and that will put the center screen into the right mode. Then this up down toggle here will go through your stations, but it doesn't go through your favorites. It just goes numerically, sequentially. So if you're on channel 10 and you wanna to get to channel 50, you gotta go 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, you're gonna be here forever. There's no way to go through your presets. And I find that infuriating because, you know, maybe I don't want to have this on there all the time. I don't need to see the station information here. Maybe I want my air pressure information here. Maybe I want my odometer, my trip odometer there. Maybe I want something else. But if anything else is on that screen, then this button does something different and I can't change radio stations. Now, I don't mean to sound like, you know, everything's horrible about the technology in the car. I mean, it does have some stuff that does work. I mean, it's obviously got Bluetooth. It has a 360 degree camera, which is great for getting into parking spaces and things. It does have a bunch of collision avoidance things that are nice. They're not the most up-to-date collision avoidance things, but they do work. So it's not all terrible, but honestly, for a car that costs as much as this, I would expect at least some 
cutting edge features. Oh, and by the way, look at these. Accessible USB ports. For some reason, the folks in the back get accessible USB ports, but the folks in the front don't. You might have heard some people say that DBX is an SUV that drives like a sports car. Or maybe you've heard them say that it's like a Vantage on stilts. Well, it is definitely nothing like a Vantage. Anybody who tells you that the DBX drives like a Vantage is high on crack, because that's just not true. Now, as far as driving like a sports car, I don't know about that either. I mean, there's more to being a sports car than just power, right? I mean, a sports car is an agile, nimble thing where the driver feels connected to the machine. You know, in a sports car, you feel the road through the steering wheel. You feel it through the suspension and you feel the engine through the gas pedal and the transmission and the exhaust note. You don't get a lot of that kind of thing in the DBX. But then again, that's probably a good thing because, I mean, think about it. Do you really want your luxury SUV to drive like a sports car? Yeah, that might be fun for a day or so, but after that, you're probably going to start thinking, man, this is the worst SUV in the history of SUVs. The fact is, the DBX is much more refined than that. When you're in GT mode like we are now, the DBX is quiet, it's smooth, and it just has a really nice, refined, and very precise feel to it. But when you want power, oh my god, it's there. This car has so much pull. It has pull when you're already moving, and it has pull from a stop. And what makes it so good is the fact that it's four-wheel drive. If I punched my Vanquish like I just did to this, the rear wheels would have lost traction. I would have had the traction control light come on, and I just wouldn't get that same effect. But in the DBX with four-wheel drive, it just stays planted on the ground and all of that power, 542 horsepower, it just all gets directed to the car. You can also put the car into sport mode. And when you're in sport mode, well, the steering tightens up, the suspension gets a little stiffer, the exhaust note gets a little louder, and it's just that much more fun to drive. And you can drive it in automatic mode and it's fine, but really the best way to appreciate sport mode is to throw it into paddle shifter mode because then, then you've got full control over everything. You can control the exhaust note, you can control the acceleration. This is the way to drive the DBX. There's also a Sport Plus mode. Sport Plus mode should really be called track mode because while it does open things up even more than regular sport mode, unfortunately, it also cripples your traction control. Traction control is a pretty important safety feature really don't want to have that crippled when you're on public roads. So it's not a mode that I normally drive in. Every now and then I'll turn on Sport Plus mode just to show somebody or just to have a little bit of fun, but regular Sport mode is really the mode you want to be in when you're just driving around. Now the DBX also has an individual mode. That's basically a custom mode where you can set up your suspension, the engine, the exhaust, the steering, you can set it up how you want. And the way I have it set up is that the engine is in GT mode, the steering is in sport mode, the suspension is in GT mode, and the exhaust is in sport plus mode. This is how I like to drive the car just generally every day. But here's one little thing that really is irritating. The car does not remember your setting each time you start it back up. Now, it remembers your individual, your custom setting, but it throws the car back into GT mode every time you start it up. Kind of defeats the purpose of having an individual mode. I mean, individual mode is set up because that's how I want it, which means it should default to that. But instead, every time the car starts, I've got to remember to press the button and throw it into individual mode so it's set the way I want. So the fuel economy in the DBX is terrible. The fact is the fuel economy, well, just using the word economy doesn't make any sense. We average about 14 mpg in this car. That's not very good. 
that's half of what my wife's previous car got. And it's kind of surprisingly bad considering how many eco-saving features there are in this. We have a nine-speed transmission, which should help. We have engine start-stop, which should help. We have cylinder deactivation, which should help. And I'm sure it all is helping, but it just makes you wonder how bad the fuel economy would be otherwise. I genuinely, and I mean this, I feel terrible about buying a car with such horrible fuel economy these days. Now, Aston Martin is supposedly going to eventually have a hybrid or an electric version of the DBX, so that'll be nice. But in the meantime, the really poor fuel economy is one thing that detracts from this being a really perfect daily driver. Now, in addition to having incredible horsepower, the other thing that makes driving the DBX so good is the suspension. And the suspension in here is assisted by a, well, an electronic anti-roll system. And what that basically means is that, well, the car stays flat in the turns. And what this does is it gives you the illusion of the car being lighter than it is. It makes the car feel more lightweight because unlike a normal SUV, which would lean into the turns, this one stays flat and it just feels so much more agile and more maneuverable. Now it's not maneuverable like a sports car, don't get me wrong, you can't really throw this thing around the same way, but it definitely feels way more agile than your average SUV. Now this anti-roll system, it only works side to side because if you punch the gas, the car does tend to lurch up a bit and that makes you remember, oh yes, this is an SUV. But as far as handling goes, from side to side when you're on these roads like this, oh, it really, really does a fantastic job. If I've got one complaint, at least one serious complaint about the DBX, it's going to be about the brakes. The brakes in this car, for some reason, are very inconsistent. And what I mean by that is that you get a different result every time you press the brake pedal. So for example, we live in a cul-de-sac and there's a stop sign at the end of this cul-de-sac. Sometimes I will pull the car out of the driveway. I'm going less than 10 miles an hour. I roll up to this stop sign and I'll hit the brakes. And sometimes it feels like the brakes are not responding. And I suddenly have to go, whoa, and I have to press the brakes a whole lot harder to make the car stop. Other times I'll be driving down the highway and there's a red light in front of me. I hit the brakes. I go into a sudden moment of panic because it feels like the car isn't going to stop and I feel like I might ram the car in front of me. This has actually happened several times. I don't know why it does this and it's not a problem with this specific car because my wife and I noticed the exact same problem on the demo car that we drove last summer. It was actually one of the things we wrote down on the little survey card that they had us fill out after we were done with that test drive. There are a couple of other little minor complaints, nothing huge here. One of them is, well, the paddle shifters. Now this car has a nine speed transmission, which means that you're going to be shifting a lot. And unfortunately, Aston Martin made the decision to put very clickety clickety paddle shifters in here. I mean, listen to this. Paddle shifters should not make any sound whatsoever. But these paddle shifters click, and they click a lot. Now the other really minor beef that I have with the car is that when you're in automatic mode with the transmission, there is quite a delay between when you push the gas pedal down and you get acceleration. Sometimes this delay is only maybe half a second, not a big deal, but other times it can be as much as a second and a half. And it's really weird. Now, Granted, you know, if you care about acceleration, you shouldn't be using the automatic transmission anyway. You should be in paddle shifter mode so that you have control over everything. But nevertheless, it is a little bit strange that one 1,000, two 1,000, you know, it, it, there's just a little bit of a delay there, and it's more of a delay than I've ever felt in any car before. The DVX really is a fun car to drive. I mean, it's not fun like driving a Vantage or my Vanquish or anything like that. It's a different kind of fun. It's an SUV. You can't lose track of that one fact. But as far as SUVs go, this really is as good as it gets. I mean, aside from the problem that I have with the brakes, 
everything else about it is just so good. I mean, just the fact that when you nail that accelerator down, oh, and it just launches you. I mean, how can you not have fun doing that? So now let's talk about price. Well, when they first announced the DBX, the base price of this was going to be $193,000. That's with delivery, but without any options. Quite frankly, that was too much. And luckily, Aston Martin's new CEO, Tobias Moores, he agreed. He knew that that was too much as well. So he lowered the price. The base price is now about $180,000. However, it's pretty unlikely that you're ever going to find one of these for $180,000 because, well, you're going to need to add options on. These bonnet blades, they're not included in the base price of the car. Those will cost you extra $1,100 for either black or chrome. The chrome grille, that's included. But if you want this in black, that's $6,100. Oddly, the lower body pack can be in black and it's standard, or you can match the paint color, still standard. But if you want this in carbon fiber, that's $15,200. You like the ribbon wheels here? Well, that'll cost you anywhere from $3,100 to $4,600. You like the red brake calipers? Well, that's another $1,600 upgrade. Sport exhaust, $2,300. If you want a leather color that's a little bit more exotic than just your basic black, well, that's going to cost you at least $3,400. And if you want all the fancy stitching and the broguing on your seats, well, that'll be $4,600. And if you want to be able to choose what color stitching you want on your leather, well, that's also another $1,100. The wood veneer down here, that's a $1,600 option. If you want the solid walnut, that's $7,600. Now, this is just a sampling of all of the upgrades that you can get on the DBX. Believe me, there are eight ton more things to choose from. In reality, the average cost of one of these is probably going to be around $210,000 to $220,000. Yes, you will find some for less, and yes, you can very easily option this thing way, way above $220,000. So, is it worth it? Well, that depends on how you look at it. If you look at the DBX objectively, I'm not going to lie, it's a tough sell. I mean, yeah, it is arguably the best looking SUV out there, but it's also the SUV with four-year-old Mercedes tech. It's missing a lot of tech. It has no new cutting edge features. The performance is great, but it's not bragging rights great because it is kind of at the bottom of what performance SUVs do these days. So why then would anybody buy one of these? Why did we buy one of these? Well, the answer is quite simple and it's right here. It's an Aston Martin. Nobody in the history of the universe has ever bought an Aston Martin for its cutting edge technology. The fact is, you buy one of these because of the exclusivity. You buy one of these because it's hand built, because it's British, maybe even because of the James Bond connection. You buy it because it is an Aston Martin. If the Aston Martin brand means nothing to you, then this probably isn't the SUV for you. But if the Aston Martin brand does mean something to you, then yeah, I do think it's worth $200,000. So what kind of letter grade would I give the Aston Martin DBX? Well, for exterior styling, it definitely gets an A+. I mean, yeah, it should probably lose some points for the Kia Telluride turn indicator lights up front, and it doesn't have the dual exhaust in the back. But honestly, those ribbon wheels are extra credit, so it still gets an A+. Now, as far as the interior goes, I'm going to give that an A minus. There's definitely, you know, a few little places that they can improve, maybe a little bit more bling here and there, but it's a really nice interior. So A minus on that. As far as the tech goes, well, that's a different story. I mean, it deserves an entire letter grade deduction alone just for the lack of a dedicated station control button on the steering wheel. It deserves another whole letter grade deduction just for the lack of a touchscreen, and then it goes on from there. But the fact is, some of the tech does work, so it doesn't get an F, but I'm going to give the tech a D. As far as how it drives, well, I have to judge that based on what this is, and what this is is a daily driver SUV, and it's fantastic at that. I'm going to give it an A minus, and the only reason for the minus instead of an A or an A plus is mainly because of the brakes and also a little bit because I do wish I could get a little bit more out of that exhaust note. So what's the overall letter grade that I would give the DBX? Well, my heart says this is an A to an A plus car, and we love it. 
But objectively speaking, I've got to take some things into account. The tech is not very good. The car is missing a ton of features that should be here. No soft closed doors, no heads up display, no massage seats and so on. I've also got to take into account the fact that it does need 50 more horsepower in order to be more competitive performance wise with the other performance SUVs out there. So overall, I'm giving it a B plus. Now that's still very good. Don't get me wrong, it only would take a few tweaks from Aston Martin to really bring this up objectively to an A to an A plus car. But like I say, in my heart, it is an A plus. I'm curious to know what you guys think. Please leave your comments below. And as always, thanks for watching.